gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for them, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We constantly need your direction, and and you have a fantastic way of of giving us direction through your word and by the leaders that you have placed in your churches. We ask for that special leadership, that special outpouring of your spirit as we listen to these words and listen to the message prepared for this morning. Lord, let your spirit be here among us, working in our hearts, directing us, giving us confidence, giving us Uh, assurance that you are still Lord of the church, no matter what the world looks like. You are still Lord of the world, your king, no matter what our life looks like. Please bring us back to that truth and help us to understand that because of your love, we are connected to order and prosperity and peace. And then, Lord, help us to live for the peace of the world in which we live as well. Bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know how many of you realize that this particular building <clears throat> has an old coal room. How many of you have been down into the coal room? A couple of you. Oh, good, good, good share of you. Well, you might have seen this picture in the old coal room. It's, it's down in the corner. It's... Uh, it's just locked away. It's where we keep some of the files, you know, from years and years and years ago. And it had this picture in there, among a couple of others, from early on in our church's history. This was the vision. What happened? That's not what this building looks like. There's something different going on here. And that's exactly the point of this message. Every one of us has a vision. I think it should run this way. I think it should work this way. I think it should look like this. But wait a minute, it looks like this. And if this is our vision for this building, and yet our building looks like it looks, which I still think is a very beautiful building, it's just a different beautiful If we are not in a building that looks like that, but instead in a building that looks like this, or if my idea for what the church should be doing doesn't match what God is doing in the church, can I still be here, support the ministry? Can I still find an active part in the work of God's church? Or do I have to go off and find a place that looks just like that, like my vision? This is the issue that God's people were running into in their day. When Jeremiah was a prophet and when Isaiah was a prophet and several other prophets were in power, 
God kept sending them visions about what the future was going to look like. And one of them comes up here in Jeremiah 29. You probably recognize that very famous passage where it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. The context of that passage is what's fascinating. See, God had allowed a pagan ruler by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, to gain amazing power in the world at that time. And this, this guy thought he was, was everything, and because he looked like he was everything. If he snapped his fingers, people got scared. If he looked at you wrong, people cowered. This man had absolute authority in his part of the world at that time. He was the dominant force, and he had a military that could back him up. And then Judah and Jerusalem were under his supervision, if you will, under his power, but they rebelled against him. They were obnoxious, and they were subversive. And he sent his mil military force in and essentially wiped them out, with the exception of the ruling classes and a few of the poor on one end, but then all the, the, the ruling classes and the, the princes, the leaders, and those people he hauled off to Babylon. Now, he did that because the way to to take care of people in that time. According to Nebuchadnezzar's plan, his vision, when people were subversive, one, you could kill them off, but he recognized the wealth of intellect and skill in these individuals. And he said, what if we brought them to Babylon and mixed them with the culture in Babylon and they got comfortable with the culture and the wealth of Babylon and they just stopped being subversive because they melted in. And it worked with many other peoples. Babylon became an incredibly powerful, dominant force in that part of the world, and the Jews knew what Nebuchadnezzar's plan was, and they said, no! They remained stubborn and obstinate. In fact, they actually encouraged their prophets and their priests and their seers, their future tellers, their vision setters, um, here is what we want you to prescribe as a future for us. And they went to these prophets and they went to these seers and maybe they paid them off and said, here's our vision. Now come to us as a group and tell us that this is what the Lord says. Verses 8 and 9 say this. Yet this is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. God is saying to them, you stuck your noses into an area where you do not belong. Um, this is not what you are supposed to, you're not supplying this vision, you're not supplying this dream, you are not supplying this future. This is not what I prescribed. So he says to them, in verses six, verse six and following, uh, four and following, I'm sorry. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those I carried off into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now that's a great place to start. Let's carry on with our notes. Here is what God wants them to do. He wants them to be resident aliens. Now that does not match their vision. They looked at this man, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, an incredibly horrible pagan unbeliever um, and shrines all over the city of Babylon and, and they said, we will not blend in. In fact, we're going to move out to the Kabar River, a, a canal just outside of the city. And they did. And they settled down there. But God comes to them and says, uh, no, that's not the plan. You're forgetting something. You think Nebuchadnezzar hauled you off into exile. And in fact, it says in the opening verses, Nebuchadnezzar hauled you off into exile. But then in verses 4 and 7, God makes it very clear. Yes, those are the social and political and military forces of that day that hauled you off into exile in Babylon. But those are my political forces. Those are my military forces. I am the king sitting on the throne. I directed them to take you there. 
consider that from the point of view that we have when we've got our vision of what we think that the future should be. And God says, is that your idea or is that mine? Is that your picture or is that the picture I'm bringing? Well, let's see what the picture God's bringing. First, he says to the exiles, be resident aliens. Don't, don't separate from them. Live and settle there. Don't separate or withdraw. Because it would be easier to just be separate. The Jews, you, you don't have to fight as hard. You, you actually have more power if you separate. You have more autonomy. You can be in charge of things. It's easier to not mix with the, the riffraff the outside culture, if you just stay in your tight little old German or Norwegian or, or ethnic group, whatever group you're in, or Lutheran or Christian, it's easy. Er. God says, live and settle there. Don't separate or withdraw. Philanthropists and sociologists studying the churches and religion in the last number of years have come to a conclusion that there are one of two types of religious groups, typically. There are the kinds that do separate or withdraw. They oftentimes have, this is the kind of group, and there's the other kind of group that just assimilates incredibly well with the culture. So the first kind, the kind that separates, they have incredibly high walls to, to, to climb over until you can actually become a member of that group. They have very stringent demands, very difficult things that you have, very difficult hoops you have to jump through. And if you can jump through all these hoops, well, we'll bring you into membership. That's one kind of religious group that is typically seen. But the other kind of group is the kind that says, you know what? We're here in the community. You live in the community. We live in the community. Hey, come on in. What do you like? We like it too. What do you think? We think that too. What do you love? We love that too. We're just like you. Neither one is what God is asking us to do. He doesn't say separate, put such high bars in front of people that they cannot get close to God. No, he says live, settle there. Don't separate or withdraw. Mix in. Mix in. Be a part of the community. But then he also says, be resident aliens. So where it's, it's easy to be a fundamentalist and separate and, and be a separate from the culture that we're in, God says, no, I want you to be a part of it. When you mix it, live with them, get to know them. Uh, go to the local co-ops, uh, go to the, the local stores, get to know your neighbors, understand their beliefs and their, their teachings, because everybody's got them. But be resident aliens. This is not your home. You're in exile. This is not where you're going to live permanently. This is just a stopping ground. This is a step on our way to our real home, where Christ is the King, where the, our Father waits with open arms because of the sacrifice of His Son. This is just a stopping place. So, what does that mean? Respectfully resist, with emphasis on respectfully. And that means, yes. I can be close to someone who's got different faith background than I have, and yet I can say, well, I, I re respect your opinion, your, your insight, and maybe I can learn something from you. Um, I like the way you do this and this and this. I like the way you raise your children. I like the way you recycle. I like the way you blah, blah, blah. But, but in my understanding of the God of the universe, I can't do this, I can't do that. Respectfully resist. So God does ask us to be a part of the culture, 
but not to assimilate all the elements of the culture. And that's not easy. So he's, God is essentially saying, I want you get, to get into a very difficult place where you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to feel a little bit on edge. People are going to say things that, la, 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 I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. But you have to hear that. They believe that. They live that. And you can't take me there unless you're there. You got to be there. You got to be mixing in with them. But you need to continue to resist. Don't give in to their values or assimilate. And then the third part of this is a very fascinating part as well. He says, pray for the peace of the city. And the word, it says peace and prosperity in English. The, the word is one word in, in Hebrew. It's shalom. Pray, pray for the shalom. Shalom doesn't just mean peace, although sometimes we think it does. Shalom means May you emotionally be secure. May you have a, a strong physical foundation. May your buildings be strong. May your children be strong. May your work prosper. That's shalom. It means I don't want any chaos for your life. Instead, I want order. That's shalom. So it's peace and prosperity. And God says... Be a Christian there, learn about them, learn about their passions, learn about their drives, learn about what excites them, learn about what gets them up in the morning. And then pray for the shalom of the city. Well, some of those people I don't agree with. Some of them actually don't like me very much. They won't. There's some that are going to hate you for, for who you are. There's some people that when you get up and you walk outside and you see your neighbors out there, you just want to go hide behind your tool shed because I just don't want a confrontation right now. Or there's a person that you may meet in the grocery store, you see him coming down the aisle, you quickly skip to the next aisle. <laughs> see, they almost saw me. <laughs> he wants us to interact with them. And maybe, you, maybe you're not ready to meet them face-to-face -face and talk with them face-to-face, -face, but learn about who that person is, whether they're an enemy, whether they're an obnoxious neighbor, or someone in your own family that you're just having a difficult time with. Here's the direction. Pray for the shalom, the peace of them. So sit down, and for the next two weeks, for every day of the next two weeks, come up with a list. Lord, I think this is what they need. What do you think they need, Lord? Yeah, that's a good idea. And pray for it. Maybe they need more stability in their family. Maybe they need a heart that's open to God's love. Maybe they need to know that somehow through a Christian, God loves them. And maybe I am or you are that Christian. Pray for their peace. It's hard. I can guarantee you it's hard. But as you start to pray for their peace, you'll notice that your heart toward them starts to change. And you start to become more engaged. And it's almost like you become concerned about them. And when you become concerned, it's almost like you could meet them face to face and, and not be terrified by them. Pray for the peace. Pray for their success. And then sacrificially love them there. All right, oh, I can pray for them, but I have to do something now? How? Well, don't be selfish or contemptuous, defensive or belittling. That's a good start. All of this is just a horrible list of demands that I've just placed on, on you this morning. And you can't do it and I can't do it unless we see the answer to this question. The hidden secret of Christianity right here on this next slide. The essence of why we exist as a congregation on this very next slide. You ready? It'll rock your world. 
Christ Jesus purposely went into exile. He had a very plush apartment up in heaven. And his father said to him, I've got a stinky, smelly barn that I'd like you to be born in. Do you mind? Okay, I'll do it. And the father said to the son, you know, you're going to have to be born in a family where everybody thinks you're a bastard child, that your mother's screwed around and and your father's not really your father. Okay, I'll do it. And you're going to have to live your life when some of the people get it, but they're going to be like prostitutes and they're going to be tax collectors and they're going to be the worst, the, the dregs of society. They're going to love you. And then the, the pastors and the religious leaders and the, the, the mature believers are going to hate you. Okay, I'll do it. Well, it's not it. And then they're going to crucify you. They're going to tear the skin off your back with whips. I'll do it. This is the secret of Christianity. This is why we exist. Come into the culture, get to know the people, don't assimilate to the culture, and sacrificially love them there because Christ Jesus laid down his life for the world. But I tell you what, if you leave it at Jesus died for the world, God so loved the world, and it never translates into your heart as God so loved me, you're going to have no energy, no power to go forward and do this very impossible task. You're going to say, I give up. If you do not know he died for you, But when you do, when you do, oh man, when you do, why do you think Pastor Terry Schultz is so on fire every time he comes here? Because he knows that Jesus died for the stuff that he did back in his 20s and his teens and his 30s and even now today. And and Pastor Terry Schultz, you know his excitement. He knows Jesus died for him. Why would he go to Peru and why would he go to Haiti unless he gets it? And some of you have been there too because I know you get it. How can we as a church move into the future the vision that God is giving us? Know that he died for you, for you. Let that stir deep into your hearts. It's not just he died for a number He died for you. He died for you. Let's pray. Glorious, amazing, risen Savior King, it is for you that we are to live and for the people of this culture. I would rather stay separate I'd rather condemn from a distance. But you've asked us to engage this culture. You've asked us to get close to them. Heavenly Father, if we're going to do this, we need to know how you engaged yourself into this pitiful world, this desert of a world. You came down to dryness and despair and agony and pain and murder and filth because of me because of every last individual in this room. Dear Lord, help us to see, not just with our minds, but with our hearts. Help us to see that you love us deeply. Help us to see that that's why you engaged in this world. And then help us to have the power and the determination and the will to also engage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me? Christians over 1,700 years ago have given us a document that we call the Nicene Creed. And in there, they stated their deep-founded beliefs in the God who reigns on the throne in heaven. Please speak these with me. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. One Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Our ushers will be coming around to collect your thank offerings. Now this is for the members of our church only. As members of the the church, we support the ministry um, in several different ways. And one of them is by giving our tithes, giving our offerings to God.